John Eliot was a Puritan pastor and early immigrant to the land of America, before it was the United States. In fact, he came to America in 1631 at the age of 27, 145 years before it would become the United States of America in 1776. His life was centered around his faith in Jesus Christ, and he had a passion for the Native Americans. He saw them as God's children in need of love, not simple-minded natives as so many thought in his day. In fact, his passion for bringing Christ to the indigenous people of America was so great that he became known as the Apostle to the Indians. He was also passionate about languages and education. He was the founder of the Roxbury Latin School in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1645. His story is not found in too many history books, but he was a transformational figure that helped pave the way for the success of this nation. In fact, he may have even been prophesied about in the Book of Mormon. Stay tuned to the end of this and we will investigate this idea. This presentation will bring to light the life of a man devoted to God and willing to sacrifice for the welfare of others. Join me as we investigate the life and ministry of John Eliot. John Eliot was born in Woodford, Hertfordshire, England in 1604 and lived at Nazing as a boy. He was the third of seven children of Bennett and Latisse Elliot. His father was a wealthy landowner with properties in Eastwick, Hudson, Ware, and Woodford, England. He attended Jesus College, Cambridge, starting in 1619 as a 15-year-old. After he graduated college in 1622, learning about Greek and Roman literature, he became assistant to Thomas Hooker, teaching at a private school in Little Badow, Essex. In 1625, he became a lecturer at the Church of St. Mary the Great in Cambridge, largely because of the influence of Thomas Hooker. Thomas Hooker was an excellent preacher of the gospel. However, in 1629, Arch Archbishop William Laud set his sights on Hooker and labeled him as a Puritan sympathizer. Hooker was forced to flee for his life to the Netherlands due to the political turmoil in England and the church. This left John Eliot in a precarious situation, without a job and his former mentor on the run. John decided to immigrate to Boston, Massachusetts, which was only a year old at the time, arranging passage as a chaplain on the ship Lyon. Three of his brothers and three of his sisters migrated with him. They arrived on November the 3rd, 1631. Elliot, who was now 27 years old, became minister and teaching elder at the First Church in Roxbury, a position that he would hold until his death in 1690. John Elliot had been engaged to Hannah Mumford in England before he left for America. She ended up migrating to the American colonies a year later, and they were married on September 4, 1632. Their marriage was the first marriage in the town of Roxbury. From 1637 to 1638, Eliot famously participated in both the civil and church trials of Anne Hutchinson during the Antinomian Controversy, which is also sometimes called the Free Grace Controversy. The primary argument presented by Anne Hutchinson and her supporters was that works were not necessary in the Christian walk, and that salvation only came by grace. John Eliot and the other Puritan fathers held to the idea that works were a result of your faith, and therefore necessary. Eliot disapproved of Hutchinson's views and actions, and was one of the two ministers representing Roxbury in the proceedings. Anne Hutchinson ended up being excommunicated and exiled. Historian Michael Winship called Anne Hutchinson the most infamous English woman from the American colonies. In 1640, John Eliot and fellow ministers Thomas Weld, who was also of Roxbury, Thomas Mayhew of Martha's Vineyard, 
and Richard Mather of Dorchester are credited with editing the Bay Psalm Book, the first book published in the British North American colonies. The Bay Psalm Book was an arrangement of the Book of Psalms in poetic form to be used as a sort of early hymnal during worship. It remained in common use for over a hundred years. This book has actually become very rare. In November of 2013, one of only 11 known copies to exist of the first edition sold at Sotheby's for $14.2 million, which still today holds the record for a printed book sale. In 1645, Eliot founded the Roxbury Latin School in Boston. This school is still in existence today and is the oldest independent school in continuous existence in North America. In 2010, it was ranked fifth best prep school in America with 20% of its students going on to attend Harvard. Settling in the growing Puritan community of Roxbury, John's pastoral duty soon intertwined with a deep sense of purpose. Eliot's heart swelled with compassion for the Native American inhabitants who shared the land around New England. This burgeoning connection marked the beginning of a lifelong friendship between cultures. Eliot's missionary zeal took root, driven by an unshakable conviction that he was called to not just be a pastor to a congregation of believers, but to bring Jesus to the Native American communities. He dedicated himself to mastering the Algonquin language, the key to unlocking the hearts and minds of those he sought to reach. Days turned into years as he tirelessly studied, conversed with native speakers, and crafted an Algonquin dictionary and grammar guide. The Algonquin people were found in the northeastern part of the United States, primarily centered around the Great Lakes. They lived as far west as Missouri and all the way to the eastern Atlantic coastline and up into Canada. This tribal group was actually made up of many tribes, including the Mi'kmaq, the Mohegan, the Croatan, the Powhatan, the Wampanoag, uh, the Shawnee, the Kickapoo, the Oneida, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and, and others. Learning their language was a critical component of sharing the truth of the gospel with them. It was also evidence to them of John's passion for them in that he would put forth the effort to learn their language. In 1651, John interpreted and published the Bay Psalm book in the Algonquin language. The chief barrier to preaching to the American Indians was language. Gestures and pidgin English were used for trade but could not be used to convey a sermon. Other missionaries had attempted to share Christ with the Native Americans, but had failed due to language and cultural barriers. John's approach was different. He would meet them where they were by learning their customs and becoming fluent in their language. Eliot relied on a young Native American named Kakano. Kakano had been captured in the Pequot War of 1637 and became a servant of an Englishman named Richard Collicott. John Eliot said, He was the first that I made use of to teach me words and to be my interpreter. Cockano could not write, but he could speak Massachusetts and English. With his help, Eliot was able to translate the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and other scriptures and prayers into the Algonquin language. John spent two years learning Algonquin and a few of the other Native American dialects. The first time that Eliot attempted to preach to the Indians in their language was on October 28, 1646, at Dorchester Mills. He failed miserably and said that they gave no heed unto it, but were weary and despised what I said. The second time he preached to the Indians was at a, the wigwam of Waban, near Watertown Mill, which was later called Nonantum, which is today called Newton, Massachusetts. John Eliot was not the first Puritan missionary to try to convert the Indians to Christianity, but he was the first to produce printed publications for the Algonquins 
in their own language. The ability to communicate and the effort applied in learning their language made all the difference in earning their respect. In 1654, John, who was now 50, established the first Native American grammar school in the colonies in Roxbury. It was aimed at educating the Native American children and spreading the gospel message. John integrated Christian teachings with Native customs into the curriculum so that they could learn to read and write as well as have a full knowledge of Christ and an appreciation of their own culture. John taught in a 20 by 30 meeting house that had a thatched roof and plastered walls for over 40 years. In 1660, John Eliot completed the monumental task of translating the Bible from English to the Massachusetts Indian language. It was printed by Marmaduke Johnson and Samuel Green on the press in Cambridge, Massachusetts. By 1663, Marmaduke and Green had printed 1,180 volumes of the Old and New Testaments. The Indian Bible was titled Mamuse Wanatupana Tamwe Upbiblium God, or in English, the Holy Bible containing the Old Testament and the New. This would be the first Bible printed in America, and it was in the Algonquin Indian language. The reason the Bible had never been printed before in the Americas was because of the King of England, who was King James. He had had a monopoly on all Bible printing. Before King James, the Bible used by the Puritans was the Geneva Bible, which was translated in such a way to support the teachings of John Calvin, placing God's authority above all monarchs. The King James Version, which was first printed in 1611, instead was translated in a way to emphasize the majesty of kings. Due to this conflict between Puritan believers and the Church of England, Bibles were only allowed to be printed in England and had to be imported to the colonies. This rule did not apply to the Algonquin Bible, so it became the first Bible printed in this hemisphere. John also instigated a social experiment. He organized the natives that had converted to Christianity into small villages where they could share, learn, and grow in their faith. Each village had a school where Indians were taught to read the message of Jesus. The villages were also governed by a biblical code of law. The settlers referred to these groups of converted natives as praying Indians. By translating documents into Algonquin, this allowed other missionaries to come and learn and teach in these villages. John wanted to leave a lasting legacy beyond his own. He envisioned these villages growing into thriving communities of loving Christians, all working together for the common good and living as the body of Christ. Villages were not just social political entities, but rather a gathering of people desiring to integrate the gospel principles into their everyday lives. John understood that he was not trying to convert the Native Americans to a church denomination, nor to a political construct. He was simply sharing Christ with them. One interesting detail about the Algonquin people is they did not seem to have any form of a written language, at least that John had ever seen. They relied on verbal and pictorial language to communicate. Introducing a written alphabet allowed them to learn and communicate at a higher level. Due to the availability of Christian materials in Algonquin, other missionaries also came and set up these praying Indian towns, as they were called, all around New England. At one point, there were 14 of these praying Indian towns with over 4,000 converted Christians. John's effort among the the native inhabitants of America was so inspiring to the Christians in England, it prompted the formation of, and I love these long names, Company for for Propagating the Gospel in New England and Parts Adjacent in North America, established in 1649. This organization would help gather funds across England to help support this Christian effort in America. This was the first genuine missionary society ever formed, 
and it provided the means to build up the new villages of believers in the new world. John wrote this note in July of 1670 to some of his fellow pastors, elders, and contributors in England. Upon the 17th day of the sixth month, 1670, there was a meeting at Mottapag near Sandwich in Plymouth Patent to gather a church among the Indians. There were present six of the magistrates. The magistrates were the local Indian leaders from each tribe and many elders, all of them messengers of the churches within that jurisdiction, in whose presence, in a day of fasting and prayer, they making confession of the truth and grace of Jesus Christ, did in that solemn assembly enter into covenant, to walk together in the faith and order of the gospel, and were accepted and declared to be a church of Jesus Christ. Elliot's methods for missionary work set a pattern of subsequent Indian missions for almost two centuries. Civilization, he believed, was closely bound up with evangelization and personal sacrifice. Missionaries sent all over the world modeled their approach to missionary work after John's example. Unfortunately, the praying Indian towns suffered a death blow during King Philip's War in 1675. King Philip's war was between some of the Native American tribes and the colonial settlers. Indians, by, by many, were now seen as the enemy to the crown. In fact, after this war, there were no missions in the Connecticut area until 1726, over 50 years later, when Cotton Mather founded a school on the Mohegan Reservation. Elliot also wrote other books during his time working with the Native Americans. In fact, his book, and another long title here, The Christian Commonwealth or the Civil Rights and Policy of the Rising Kingdom of Jesus Christ, is considered the first book on politics written by an American author. It was also the first book banned by a North American governmental unit. It promoted self-governance by the voice of the people, a republic. It would be an inspiration for the government that would form in 1776 in the colonies. Originally, he wrote the book in the late 1640s and finally got it published in England in 1659. It proposed a new model of civil government based on the system that Eliot had instituted among the converted Indians, which was based in turn on the government Moses had instituted among the Israelites in the wilderness. Eliot asserted that Christ is the only right heir of the crown of England, and called for an elected theocracy in England and throughout the world. The ascension to the throne of, of Charles II of England made the book an embarrassment to the Massachusetts colony. In 1661, the general court forced Eliot to issue a public retraction and apology. They banned the book and ordered all copies destroyed. Obviously, a king does not want to allow a movement to grow that will threaten his absolute power, even if the writer is stating that Christ is the only heir to the throne. John's ideas about a republic in America would not see prominence again for over a hundred years until our nation was formed. In 1689, John, in one of his last deeds that he did before he died, donated 75 acres of land to support the Elliott School in what was then Roxbury's Jamaica Plain District and now is a historic Boston neighborhood. Two other Puritans had donated land on which to build the school in 1676, but boarding students especially required support. Elliott's donation required that the school, which was renamed in his honor, except both black and Native American students without prejudice, which was very unusual at the time. The school continues in its, near its original location even today. John Elliott lost his wife, Hannah, in 1689, and then he himself died on May 20th, 1690, at the age of 85. His last recorded words were, Welcome, Joy. 
The city of Natick remembers him today with a monument on the grounds of the Bacon Free Library. The John Elliott Elementary School in Needham, Massachusetts, which was founded in 1956, is also named after him. Puritan historian Cotton Mather called his missionary career the epitome of the ideals of New England Puritanism. William Carey considered Eliot alongside the Apostle Paul as canonized heroes and enkindlers in his book, An Inquiry into the Obligation of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathen, in 1792, another long title. The town of Eliot, Maine, which was in Massachusetts during its incorporation, was also named after John Eliot. John Eliot's legacy extends far beyond the boundaries of his own time. His efforts laid the groundwork for future interactions between cultures in the United States. His commitment to language translation, cultural exchange, and education paved the way for a deeper understanding of the rich diversity that defines America. Even his offspring made an impact on early American life. John and his wife Hannah had six children, five sons and one daughter. Their son, John Elliott Jr., was the first pastor of the First Church of Christ in Newton. Another son, Joseph Elliott, became a pastor in Guilford, Connecticut, and later Father Jarrett Elliott, who was a noted agricultural writer and pastor. John Elliott's sister, Mary Elliott, married Edward Payson, founder of the Payson family in America, and great-great-grandfather of Reverend Edward Payson. He was also an ancestor of Louis E. Stanton, a United States attorney for the District of Connecticut. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, John Eliot may actually be prophesied of in the Book of Mormon. For many decades, a claim was made that the Book of Mormon prophesied of Columbus coming to the New World. The revelation was given to Nephi, and he spoke of the last days when his people would be scattered by the Gentiles. He spoke of a man who would come among his people, led by the Spirit of God, and he would come to the seed of Nephi in the Promised Land. This passage in 1 Nephi reads as follows, And I looked and beheld a man among the Gentiles, which were separated from the seed of my brethren by the many waters. And I beheld the Spirit of God, that it came down and wrought upon the man, and he went forth upon the many waters even under the seed of my brethren which were in the promised land. And it came to pass that I beheld the Spirit of God, that it wrought upon other Gentiles, and they went forth out of captivity upon the many waters. And it came to pass that I beheld many multitudes of Gentiles upon the land of promise. And I beheld the wrath of God, that it was upon the seed of my brethren, and they were scattered before the Gentiles, and they were smitten." And I beheld the Spirit of the Lord, that it was upon the Gentiles, that they did prosper and obtain the land for their inheritance. And I beheld that they were white and exceeding fair and beautiful, like unto my people before that they were slain. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that the Gentiles, which had gone forth out of captivity, did humble themselves before the Lord. And the power of the Lord was with them. And I beheld that their mother Gentiles were gathered together upon the waters, and upon the land also, to battle against them. And I beheld that the power of God was with them, and also that the wrath of God was upon all those that were gathered together against them to battle. And I, Nephi, beheld that the Gentiles which had gone out of captivity were delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that they did prosper in the land. And I beheld a book, and it was carried forth among them. And the angel saith unto me, Knowest thou the meaning of the book? And I saith, I know not. And he saith, Behold, it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew. And I, Nephi, beheld it. And he saith unto me, The book which thou beholdest is a record of the Jews which contains the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. And it also containeth many prophecies of the holy prophets. And it is a record, like unto the engravings upon which are upon the plates of brass, save there are not so many. 
Nevertheless, they contain the covenants of the Lord, which he made unto the house of Israel. Wherefore, they are of great worth unto the Gentiles. So according to this scripture, here are the characteristics of this man that would fit this prophecy. One, he must be a man among the Gentiles in from the old world. Number two, he must have the Spirit of God with him, and that must be his inspiration to travel upon the ocean. And three, he must have arrived on the promised land and came to the seed of Nephi's brethren. Christopher Columbus could certainly fit this description at first reading. However, his primary mission in traveling was to make money and find gold in order to finance a war to take over the land of Jerusalem. It was not to spread the gospel of Christ. Also, he made four voyages. The first two, he only landed on the islands in the Caribbean. On the third voyage, he landed on the coast of Venezuela. And on his final voyage, he, voyage, he explored Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. He never stepped foot on what would become the United States. He also treated the natives very harshly. While he does fit this prophecy, pr this prophecy to an extent, he made no impact on the Native Americans, at least spiritually, other than he ushered in a parade of Gentiles that would come to the New World for various reasons. This scripture also talks of other Gentiles that God's Spirit inspired that came out of captivity and came upon this same land of promise. The pilgrims fit this description very well. Then it talks about how Lehi's seed being, was being scattered, would be scattered by the Gentiles. I can't think of a group more scattered and nearly wiped out than the American Indians. It also talks about how the Gentiles then prosper upon the land of promise. There has not been any prosperity in the Americas other than in the United States. And this prosperity was not evident in 1830 when the Book of Mormon was brought forth. In fact, it wasn't until 1905 that America was even invited to the table of the great world powers for diplomatic talks. Nations such as France, Britain, Russia, Austria, Prussia, and Italy had far more influence in the world than the United States had at that time. It would not be until after World War I that the U.S. would have any real power in the world. Nephi's prophecy also speaks of a book of the Jews that was carried with the Gentiles that were persecuted. This was obviously the Bible, and I think it is very fitting that the first Bible printed in the Americas was printed in the language of Lehi's seed by John Eliot. These passages seem to be very clearly speaking of the land of the United States, in particular the Northeast where these prophecies all came true and the Book of Mormon was revealed. John Eliot was a devout man who loved God and loved God's people, and in particular the descendants of the people of Lehi. Even though he didn't have any idea of the covenants the Lord had made with them, more than a millennia earlier. The covenants of God not only apply to the Native Americans upon this sacred holy land, but to all of us Gentiles that are willing to live according to His will on this land. Personally, I like the idea of this prophecy being about John Eliot. But each of you must make up your own minds. One thing is for sure. We are living on the promised land, and we must not forget our part of keeping the covenant with God. My hope is that John Eliot and others like him inspire you to keep your covenant and remember that the Lord has not forgotten his people. He is coming to meet his bride, so we must prepare our lamps so we can return with him to the wedding. I hope you found this presentation enlightening and encouraging. Please don't forget to subscribe at, to the channel and, and so that you can be notified of more content like this and, and please leave some comments. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, keep seeking nothing but the truth. Take care. <laughs>